So this is the Gorgadahar temple. Sorry. We're in Champahati. Champahati is from the Champaka flowers. There were many, used to there used to be many, many Champaka flowers here. And devotees would come and collect the Champaka flowers. So it became Champahati, marketplace. We're getting flowers, the Champaka flowers. So these deities, Gorgadarhar deities, they were originally the deities of Vanina. Vanina, uh, the brother of Gadarhar Pandit, Vanina Pandit, the great devotee of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Things they have the deity of Gaur and Gadarhar. Worship of Gaur and Gadarhar is very advanced worship. 
Usually we will worship Gordon Nithai. You will see there were other Gorgadhar deities also at the Yoga Peak. Those deities up at the Yoga Peak, the Gorgadhar deities, that they were the deities of Bhakti Vinod Thakur's wife, Bhagwati Devi. And after she left the world, then the deities were installed there at the Yoga Peak because that was where Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada was staying. So, worship of Gaur Gadarhar is very, it's for very advanced devotees who are more in the Raga Bhakti. But Srila Prabhupada gave us Gora Nikai, which is for, more for preaching, because it was Gora Nikai who delivered Jagai and Madhai. And Prabhupada wanted to encourage us in the mode of preaching and distributing the mercy. And that's more there with Gaur and Nitai. Gadarhar, Gadarhar, we heard, he was very attached to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He grew up with Chait he grew up with Nimai. They went to school together. And later on, when Lord Chaitanya took sannyas, Gadarhar followed him to Puri. And Gadarhar remained there in Puri. He took Shetra Sanyas. Shetra Sanyas is something recommended by Bhaktivinoda Thakur for the Kali Yuga. In Shetra Sanyas, and they say even Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya, he was a Shetra Sanyasi. Although he was a a, he, he was a householder, he had his wife and so on, and he was living, they were living there in Jagannath Puri, but it was in the mood of renunciation. In Shetra Sanyas, you make a vow to stay in the holy place. So Gadarhar, he was Brahmachari, of course he never married, but he took that Shetra Sanyas and he was living there in Jagannath Puri, up until Lord Chaitanya wanted to leave to go to South India, Gadarhar then wanted to follow Lord Chaitanya. So that was a whole leela, Lord Chaitanya telling Gadarhar that he had to stay in Jagannath Puri. Lord Chaitanya had already, already given Gadarhar the deity of Gopinath and he wanted Gadarhar to remain there and worship his deity and keep his vow. Keeping vows was very important to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He liked to see devotees very steady in their devotional service. Just like here in this temple, I, the, the devotee who takes care of the temple is a devotee called Nityananda Brahmachari. So I asked him, are you the only person here in the temple? He said, no, no, there were three, Gaur Gadarhar and me. <laughs> so he stays here and he takes care of the deities. And before he was here, before that, there was a very elderly brahmachari. He was a disciple of Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati. He was in his 90s and he used to live here on his own and take care of Gaur Gadarhar. The deities of Gaur Gadarhar, they were discovered by Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati's disciples. They heard about how these, the deities were actually being taken, they were in someone's home, but they were not being worshipped, they were not being taken care of. So, but Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati and the devotees went there and they talked to the people and they persuaded the people to give the deities and they arranged a nice temple for the worship of Gaur Gadarhar, that they could re-establish the worship. But they were originally worshipped in the times of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by Vanida, Vaninath Brahmachari. So that's a little bit about the Gaur Gadarhar deities. And this place, Champahati, this is in Ritu Dweep 
we'll be hearing about Ritu Dweep in a little while. Ritu Dweep. You can see it's very attractive, very beautiful, many trees and flowers growing here. So all the seasons are here in this place. So we, we always have a nice program coming here. Uh, and then said also Jayadev Goswami also used to live here before he went to Jagannath Puri. So this was originally the residence of Jayadeva Goswami. So we'll, we'll be hearing about Jayadeva Goswami and his pastimes here. So uh, what, <laughs> what, So this is Ritu Dweep, and the process in Ritu Dweep is Archanam. So we're going to hear about Archanam from His Holiness, Prabodhananda Maharaj. Uh, can we have the devotees who are sitting over there? Can you move over here and join with us? Those devotees sitting in the temple, Hare Krishna. See, they're sitting talking to each other, not even listening. <laughs> Somebody has to go there and you have to chase them. Just to add a little more about deity worship, you know, Srila uh, Prabhupada writes how it's the duty of Grihastha that they should install the deity in their home and they should worship the deity. You put the deity in your home, it's very helpful for you to remember that you're not the proprietor. You bring the deity into your home, make Krishna the proprietor of the home. Worship the deity. However, deity worship is meant to be done by twice initiated devotees. You should be Brahman. You should be in the mode of goodness. If your home is not in the mode of goodness, it's not a good idea to install the deity in your home. So you should be in the mode of goodness. You should be Brahminical. Brahminical means the, Brahman, the qualities of the Brahman. And Prabhupada was very particular about two things, cleanliness and punctuality. So we try to maintain that standard in the ISKCON centers, that cleanliness is very important, keeping everything very clean, the brass, the paraphernalia used in the deity worship should be regularly cleaned and shiny, they shouldn't be left for months, and become all brown, discolored, it should be polished regularly, and cleanliness means also, if you're contaminated, you, sh you can't do deity worship. Women cannot do deity worship during their contamination period. And men also have to bathe regularly, have to put on freshly laundered cloth to worship the deity. That's very important, the standards of deity worship. Krishna, you want Krishna to to accept the worship, we have to be clean and punctual. So in, in the temple, Srila Prabhupada was very concerned that everything was done on time. The deity greetings, the offerings, everything had to be very punctual. If some lady was cooking for Prabhupada, if she was cooking Prabhupada's lunch and she was not punctual, Prabhupada would chastise her. He, everything had to be very punctual. 
And when the deities are properly worshipped with cleanliness and punctuality, then certainly Krishna will be there. Krishna will be present in the worship. So deity worship is something our ISKCON movement has set up high standard of deity worship. You can see the dress, the Sringhar, particularly the type of decoration which we do. It's very attractive. Many people appreciate the beauty of our ISKCON temples and the deities, how they're worshipped very nicely. Just, just very recently I had the opportunity to go to Rimuna and in Rimuna they have the deity of Shir Kaur Gopina. So Maharaj was speaking about Gopina and he was describing how there are the three deities, Madan, Mo, Madan Mohan, Govinda and Gopina. So in, in, Rimuna, in Rimuna the deity of Gopinath is there it was the original deity of Rimuna, Madhavendra Puri had gone there and at that time the deity had stolen part of sweet rice to give to Madhavendra Puri. And Chaitanya Charitamrita describes how the Pujari in his dream was told that the, de the deity personally told him that I've taken a pot of sweet rice, I want you to give it to my devotee Madhavendra Puri. So when the Pujari had that dream, he woke up and he immediately went and took bath. In the middle of the night, he went to take bath because he'd been sleeping, he'd been laying down resting and he, he wanted to go and see if it was actually true to see if the pot of sweet rice was actually there. So before he went into the temple room, he first of all took full bath and then went into the temple and found that pot of sweet rice. So you can understand the mood of the pujari, that he was really a pure devotee. He was very strict about cleanliness. And you'll often find just like when you go to Radha Govinda temple in Jaipur, they'll give out prasadam, but you put your hand out and they will drop the prasadam into your hand. They will not touch your hand. They're so strict about cleanliness. Sanatana Goswami was called by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. When Lord Chaitanya was residing in Jagannath Puri, one day he called for Sanatan Goswami to come and see him and Sanatan came along the beach. He didn't come on the road in front of the temple but he came along the hot sand. And because he came on the hot sand, his feet were all burned by the blazing heat of the, the sun. And the sand was so hot. So Lord Chaitanya asked him, why did you come that way? Why didn't you come in front of the temple? You could have avoided walking on the hot sand. Sanatan Goswami said, I didn't want my impure body to touch any of the pujaris who are serving Lord Jagannath. That's the humility of Sanatana Goswami, that he considered that my body's contaminated, I'm low-born, I'm a fallen soul, and the people there, many of them are serving the deities. If I touch them, he said, it would be very offensive on my part, I would contaminate them. I don't want to contaminate them because they're worshipping the deity. And so, how much high standards they have for deity worship. Jatpataka Swami told us how sometimes devotees come and ask about installing deities, but they haven't got second initiation yet. So Srila Jatpataka Swami Maharaj said, if you, if you bring the deity without being twice initiated, then it's just like playing with a doll. It's not actually real deity worship because you've not yet even come to the Brahminical platform. You're not fixed in the mode of goodness. 
So you're not actually really qualified to worship the deities. You should be Brahminical. You should have the Brahminical qualification. Then you can install the deity. Otherwise, just like playing with dolls. Okay, you're practicing. Later on, as Mara said, could be Vaidhi Bhakti and go on to come to Raga, Raga Bhakti. Raga Bhakti is a high level. We're doing Vaidhi Bhakti according to rules and regulations. But Vaidhi Bhakti can also be pure devotion. Uh, one of the places which we passed on the way here, when we came here, we passed through that one temple. We didn't stop there this morning. It's not very convenient to sit there and talk. We used to sit there. We used to, actually even before that temple was built, we used to come there to that place. That place is called Samudragar. And there are some pastimes took place there. When His Holiness Vaishnava Maharaj comes, he huh? sorry? He's not reached yet. Yeah, Vaishnava Maharaj comes, he's, he's going to talk about Samudragar. Anyway, there's one pastime which takes place at Samudragar, which I will speak about, and Maharaj can speak about Samudra Sen, and, and there'll be a drama on that pastime also. But Samudragar, it was a place where there's a conversation which took place between the Samudra, the ocean, and Ganga, Ganga Devi. So Samudra, the deity of the person of the personified deity of the ocean, spoke to Ganga Devi, saying to Mother Ganga, You're so fortunate. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is there every day bathing in your waters. You're enjoying that beautiful association. The Lord, in His most merciful form, as Mahaprabhu, He's bathing every day in your waters. But Mother Ganga spoke to Samudra and said, No, you're wrong. You think I'm fortunate? You don't, don't you know? He's going to take sannyas. He's going to leave. He's going to go away from Navadweep. He's going to go and live at Jagannath Puri. And when he's at Jagannath Puri, he'll be bathing in your water. You're going to get the mercy. And of course, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was there in Puri, Every day he would go and take bath three times a day in the sea. That is a regulation actually. He said brahmacharis bathe once a day, grihastas twice a day, sannyasis should bathe three times a day. And Mahaprabhu would do that very strictly. Every day he'd go to the sea three times a day, take his bath. So. Samudra spoke to Ganga and said, Yes, he will come here, he will come and bathe in my waters, but actually he resides eternally in Navadvi. He is bathing in your water every day, eternally, because the Mahaprabhu resides eternally in Navadvi Dham. It's a place where he's always manifest. We, if you go to Panihati, Panihati is just not very far away from Calcutta, just on the edge of Calcutta. Maybe you've all heard of Panihati, right? The Shiradahi festival. Raghunath had the Shiradahi festival from the order of Lord Nityananda. So Panihati is another place where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is eternally manifest. But he's eternally here in Navadvip Dham and he bathes every day in the Ganga. So this, this is the difference. There are 
holy places like Tirthas and there are Dams. The Dam is the place where the Lord resides eternally. A Tirtha is a place where a pastime took place, some event happened, some saint went there. Even in Srimad Bhagavatam, it, it is stated by Maharaj Yudhisthira, um, Bhavad Vidir Bhagavatas Tirtha Bhuta Swayam Vibho Tirti Kurvanti Tirtani Swanta Stena Gadabritaha. Maharaj Yudhisthira was glorifying Vidura. Vidura had gone to visit the holy places for many years and then he came back to Hastinapur to deliver Dhritarashtra. So Maharaj Yudhisthira glorified Vidura, the Tirta Kurvanti Tirtani. It is the presence of the devotee which makes the holy place. By the presence of the devotee, it became a holy place. So, because Vidura had come to visit them, they said, you've made this a holy place. So that's Tirtha. But Dham is different. Mayapur Dham, Navadvip Dham, Vrindavan Dham, the places where the Lord is residing eternally. The Lord is eternally present here. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, 500 years ago, in his manifest pastimes, he would also come here to Champahati and he would chant and dance and perform Sankirtan. So, who has not spoken yet? So we'll hear from Bhakti Tiradhamma Dharma Maharaj. Hare Krishna. So I mentioned this morning, after Mongol Arte, I was telling you how pious the people here are. Did you know that? Yes. So many people. Oh, they all come out and the whole, the whole village, the whole street, and they're all family. So very, very, very nice, very pious place, very special place. But he took all the places in the town, very, very special place. All right, so this is Chitya Nagas, and we're going to hear about Sarva Goma Bhattacharya. Brother, so we have all the seasons that are here in this retreat. You can see it coming here, it's so green, so many trees everywhere. This is a very culture. Nowadays, if they grow trees, they grow them to cut them. But here, people grow trees to enjoy the flowers and the fruit. Offered to Krishna. So, any special place is that my Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. We cannot hear. We cannot hear. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Are you hearing? Yeah, no, okay, yes. So we are saying this is where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
This is where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came for his studies.
Shankaracharya also came here to Navadvipdham. They told him, no, 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 you don't come here. We don't want you in Navadvipdham. This is the place of devotees. You go and spread your impersonal philosophy other places. We don't need this Mayavadi philosophy here in the Holy Dawn. So that all, all the Acharya to connect you to the Holy Dawn. So we had um, Sarvabhoma, he left, went to Jagannath Puri. And in Jagannath Puri, he became the guru of all the Mayavadi sannyasis, teaching them Vedanta Sutra. And so he had the nephew, brother-in-law, his brother-in-law was Gopinath Acharya. And Gopinath Acharya, he understood the identity of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he told Sarvabhama Bhattacharya that this Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he is the Supreme Lord. He's Bhagavan himself. He's come in the Kali Yuga. And Sarvabhama said, how is it possible? The Lord never comes in Kali Yuga. He's tree yuga. But Gopinath Acharya said, no, you, you don't know the philosophy. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Samba Bhami Yuge Yuge. He comes in every age. So Tabhabhama Bhattacharya, he was thinking the Lord is tree yuga. Tree yuga. In Veda, the Lord is described as tree yuga. He doesn't come in the Kali yuga. So this is the, uh, he doesn't come as a as a Lila Avatar in the Kali Yuga. But there's a Yuga Avatar in every age. And that was described in Srimad Bhagavatam for 11th Canto when Karapatana Muni met with Nimiraj. Nimiraj Maharaj inquired about the Lord's incarnations in each age. And Karapatana Muni told him, Krishna Vanna, Savisha Krishna, Sango Pranga Sapasada. The, the, those people who are intelligent, who have Sumedha Saha, they will take part in the Sankirtan movement. And the Lord comes in Krishna Vanna, Savish Akrishna. His color is Akrishna. He's not blackish, but he comes in golden color because he's coming to experience that inner desire. His inner desire is to understand the love which Srimati Radharani has for Lord Krishna. So he has taken the color, the complexion of Srimati Radharani. So in this way, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is described as being the Yuga Avatar. So Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu revealed to him the sad Bhuj form, and then also he had also explained Atmarama Sloka, Atmarama Shamanayo, Nirgranta Apirukrami, Gurvantiya Haita Kim Bhaktim, Gitambuta Kunahari. So this was very difficult verse for my bodies to explain. But how is it one who is Atmarama could be attracted to hear the glories of Krishna? Just as Sukadeva Goswami was Atmarama, but he was attracted to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. So the Mayavadis and impersonalists have great difficulty to explain because for the Mayavadis their goal is to become Atmarama. And they think once they're Atmarama, once they're able to take pleasure in the self, then there's nothing can attract them, there is nothing to have any interest, no desire. But this verse describes that even those who are Atmarama, they're attracted to hear the glories of Lord Sri Krishna. So, Lord Chaitanya, of course, as we heard, Lord Chaitanya explained this verse in many, many more different ways than Sarvabhoma had explained it. And Sarvabhoma Bharacharya, he was such a great, famous logician. He was famous throughout Bharatvarsh. 
And when he heard all this from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and after seeing the form of Sadhguj, then he became convinced and he understood the identity of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he composed wonderful verses glorifying Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Like Vairagya Vidya Mija Bhakti Yoga, Vairagya Vidya Mija Bhakti Yoga, Shikshartha Eka Purusha Purana, Shikshartha Eka Purusha Purana, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Sharera Dari, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Sharera Dari, Pambudirya Stomaham Prapadye, Srila Sarvabham Abhattacharya composed this verse describing the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that he has come to teach us Vairagya, detachment, and Vidya, transcendental knowledge in relation to Bhakti. So he is an ocean of mercy. He has come to give what had been almost lost in the course of time. So this is the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as appreciated by Sarva Bhuma Bhattacharya. So uh, uh, an interesting incident took place later on uh, with Sarva Bhuma Bhattacharya becoming a devotee. You know, everyone was shocked because he was a smarter Brahman and now he's become a Vaishnava. And that Vaishnavas are often considered to be sentimentalists and, you know, not very rational people, not like the smarter Brahmins. A lot of smarter Brahmins here in India also. But they're devotee Brahmins. Nice. Nice Brahmins. So there was uh, another time, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was asked that somehow they were, he, he quoted a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. Tatenu kampam tu shamik shamana Tatenu kampam tu shamik shamana Ujjam buddhi Tatenu kampam tu shamik shamana Ujjam buddhi Vakva purtir vidadam namaste Vakva purtir vidadam namaste Divita yo bhakti prati padayatam Divita yo bhakti prati padayatam Anchekanya Mahaprabhu said, what? That's not right. It's not bhakti prati padayatam. Sava Bhuma Bhattacharya then said, no, I, I've made it bhakti. <laughs> the verse actually says, mukti pade pradayatam. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, yes, why well, are you changing the scriptures, Sarva Bhuma? He said, well, you have to, he said, look, come on, mukti, that's what the Mayavadis, that's the impersonalist goal. They want liberation. Why we put that word mukti there? That is like hell for devotees. We don't want to encourage people in the path of mukti. We want to encourage them in the path of bhakti. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu then explained to Sarvabhoma, he said, no, you have to understand that mukti also is in relation to Krishna. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained that Lord Krishna is known as Mukunda the giver of liberation. And the ninth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam is entitled Liberation, Mukti. The ninth canto is the prelude to the tenth canto. And the tenth canto is the Thaman Bonam, the, all the glories of Lord Sri Krishna's pastimes. So he said, you can see, Mukti leads to Bhakti. So you have to, you cannot change the scripture, Sarvabhoma. The Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya had to surrender to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told him, don't mess around with the scriptures. Everything in the scriptures, every word is perfect. You just have to understand it properly. So in this way, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya became a wonderful devotee. 
He said, before I was tasting the bitter fruit of Mayavadi philosophy, but now I am relishing the nectar of Krishna Bhakti in the association of all the swan-like devotees. So this was Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya's appreciation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the Krishna consciousness movement. So, are uh, we going to have a very short drama here?